<laughs> well, this morning we are continuing our series on coincidental in the story of Esther. And as we do that, we're going to find how we deal with crazy people and how we deal with a crazy world and how we deal with the craziness in ourselves. Because if, uh, if the world isn't in control by somebody, then we end up finding that we need to control it, control our own anxieties or controlling our own fears. And I want to propose to you that one of the ways we can deal with our own craziness and the craziness of the world is by beginning to wrestle with the idea, experiment with the idea, be curious about the idea that maybe there's someone, a, a grand author, who's actually in control of the world. That would rescue us from our own fears. Isn't that true of every good book and every good movie? What you love about a particular author or a particular producer is that they are great storytellers. And even when the good guy feels like there's no way out, and even when the bad guy feels like they've got away with it, and the craziness is just spewing everywhere, you're trusting that author that there's going to be a twist or a spin at the end that brings it all together. That's certainly true of my favorite movie, The Count of Monte Cristo. In this movie, we have two characters. One of the characters would be the equivalent of, uh, of Mordecai. That's played by Jim Caviezel. And this is Ferdinand. And, I'm sorry, Ferdinand is uh, the one played over here, the equivalent of Haman. He is rich, he is powerful, he is the one that, you know, is controlling all things and is really demanding that other people bend to his will. Then we have the character that's more like Mordecai, played by Jim Caviezel. He's powerless, he's a peasant, the son of a clerk. And he gets into trouble. He's been unjustly accused of something that's going to send him to prison for life. But in his moment of running away and getting away, he turns to his friend Ferdinand for help. And as he does that, they have this tradition they do in their friendship. Every time one of them is king of the moment, they hand each other the king off a chessboard. Let's watch what happens in this scene and wonder just how out of control Jim Caviezel's character felt. And suddenly, in a moment of our favorite movie, when the good guy's been in prison for years and there's no way out, and the bad guys have got away with it all, and then in a moment there's a switch, and you find out that, oh my goodness, the Count is the original good guy, and the author has written the book in such a way that all of a sudden, the evil guy you thought there was no way he'd ever get his due, finally gets his due and consequences. And the hero you've been rooting for, but he was up the tree and there was no way out, escapes. Isn't that what we love about our favorite books? Isn't that what we love about our favorite movies? If it was just a bland story with no tension and no conflict, you'd be like, oh, what a really great movie. What makes a great movie is that classic story arc. Things once were good, now there's a conflict, and it builds and builds and builds and builds in that conflict to the point at which there's no way of escape. Evil's going to win, and good's going to be betrayed. And then in a moment, in a culmination, in a climax of the story, in a crescendo of the story, everything gets spun around, and you're like, oh, that's why that happened. And well, that's what that scene was all about, and that's what that meant, Right? That's what we love about these kind of movies. And yet when it comes to our own life, we want our own lives to be sort of bland and straight with no conflict and no difficulty and no problems. But what if we could count on an author for our story that is working together all the things in our life, good, bad, difficult, ups, downs, feelings of injustice, what if when you're reading the book of your favorite author, don't you trust that author? I've read a book like this. He's going he's gonna to find a way to make it work. Oh, this is going to be like the last book. I'm waiting for the twist. What if that same feeling you have about your favorite movie or your favorite book could be true in your own life? That you could trust that there was a grand author working together through the details of your life that even when you don't hear from that author... Even when you don't understand that author, even when you're angry at the chapter of the book you're in, you can trust the author to work all things together for good. But see, if there is no author, if there's no one ultimately in control of our story or our life, even if we feel that way or experience that, we begin to say, well, I guess if there's no author, I'll turn to worry. Or I'm going to be very, very anxious. Or if no one else is in control, I'll have to power up and take control in situations myself. We become perfectionists because if the world can't be perfect, I'll make my little piece of it perfect. 
And if no one's in control of the world, I find myself overthinking things, over protecting things, over worrying about things. But if there is an author, if there is a grand author in control of our stories, then even when there's injustice, I can trust him to bring about justice. And I can stop being so bitter and angry and keeping track of what everybody's done because I'm going to trust the author to bring about proper consequences to the bad guy. I can set boundaries with, with difficult people in my life because I'm going to trust that I don't need other people's approval in a situation. I'm going to trust that ultimately my identity comes from my trust in the author, not any particular character in the story. More importantly, if there is a grand author or controller of the world, I don't have to be controlled by fear in this scene, in this chapter. Have you ever watched a movie you've seen before? The first time you watch it, you're really nervous. second time, you're like, oh, it's not going to work out. Right? Because you know the ending and because you know the author, you're able to bring into fearful, anxious situations a sense of confidence. And God wants the same thing for us. He wants us to be able to trust him to be the author of our lives, to know that he's really in control even when he seems out of control. That's the principle we're going to look at in Esther chapter 2 today, that demanding control is what leads us to being controlled by other things. I mean, even in the movie, or the book if you read it, Edmond was once controlled by love and peace and contentment. But as he gets out all that years of just pain and agony, he now finds himself controlled by revenge. And even when he gets everything back, riches and glory, he cannot give up his need for revenge. It's controlling his life. Sometimes we're controlled by power, control, worry, lust, fear, or even independence. But the principle we're going to look at today is this. Demanding control leads to losing control until you finally discover who's really in control. And we're going to get four crazy patterns, four crazy people in the story and ways in which we can find the one secure thing to anchor our identity in a world that's very, very crazy and out of control and bring us some certainty. The first character is Xerxes. Xerxes' crazy regret. And if Xerxes had a model for his life, it would be this. By demanding control, I lost control. Chapter 2 begins by saying, after these things, it's been four years since his wife Vashti stood up before him. And during those four years, historians tell us that the Greeks went to battle with the Persians, and the Persians got obliterated. And the king, Xerxes, who set his entire identity on proving to the world that he could defeat the Greeks, it suddenly lost control. The same king who truly loved his wife but demanded that she dance before his officers wearing only a crown, in his drunken rage, he banished her, and now he's lost control and lost someone he loved. And in his attempts to demand control in his life, he lost control of his personal life, his professional life, and he's lost things he truly cared about. And in this moment of reflection, he remembered Vashti, his wife, the one person who didn't just tell him what he wanted to hear, the one woman who treated him like an equal or partner. He remembered what she had done and how what had been decreed against her was just too harsh, that he loved her, that he overreacted. By demanding control, he had lost control. But instead of taking a moment to reflect on this, he immediately decides to medicate it. And so his servants come and say, hey, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let's just find a way to to not think about that whole defeat from the Greeks. And he switches. He switches from building his life on his need to control things to building his life on medicating the pain of feeling like he had lost some things. And so that's what happens. They bring in beautiful virgins, and he basically has bachelor Persia. Now, what's interesting is that Kierkegaard, famous philosopher, he said that one of the things that we all do in our hearts is we have to build our core identity on something. And if you don't make that thing God, you'll build it on something else. Here's what Kierkegaard said. It is a normal state of the human heart to try to build its identity around something besides God. Now look at this. Spiritual pride is the illusion that we are competent to run our own lives, to achieve our own sense of self-worth and find a purpose big enough to give us meaning in life without God. So Kierkegaard says, there's not some list of necessarily right and wrong things that are the biggest deal for God. The biggest deal for God is spiritual pride that we think we should play the role of God 
bringing our own sense of meaning and purpose to our life. We think we can control how the world works, people and circumstances. That's what ultimately broken in us. In the same way that Xerxes switched from, well, I want control, that didn't work, now I'll switch to sensuality, and we'll find someone instead of Vashti. Kierkegaard said that's what our hearts do. When control doesn't work, we switch to other people's approval. When that doesn't work, we switch to, to career. If that doesn't work, we switch to retirement. When that doesn't work, we switch to our, our bottom line. But we're going to anchor our identity into something insecure if we don't anchor it into the one secure thing, which is God. And that's what he's done here. And that's why control never ultimately satisfies. The more you demand control, the more you lose control. Because it's ultimately insecure. Because you're trying to control the two things people can't control. Other human beings' behavior and circumstances. Reminds me of my favorite book when I was a kid. We read Where the Red Fern Grows, if you read it when you were a kid. It tells the story of a, a young hunter. And he's trying to train his dogs how to hunt coon. But he's got to first catch a raccoon to train them. And he chases this thing up and down the woods and can't ever catch this thing. Then an old-timer tells him that the way to capture a raccoon is to use its need for control and curiosity against itself. He says, what do you mean? They found this old hollow log and they drilled a hole in it. And the raccoon was up in the tree and could see our young boy. And he took out a little piece of metal. It was shiny. And the raccoon saw it. And he took that piece of shiny metal and he dropped it into the hole, into the hollow log. Well, sure enough, this raccoon, a few minutes later, comes down the tree, comes over, reaches into the hole, grabs the shiny piece of metal, makes a fist to grab it. And his fist is now too big to come out of the hole. Well, when the old gentleman was telling our hero that this would work, he's like, well, why doesn't the raccoon just let go? It's like, because he doesn't want to lose what he's got. So he will keep himself trapped. His need to control, his need to hold on to that shiny piece will keep him there until you can capture him. And the kid's like, there's no way this is going to work. But sure enough, in the story as it develops, the raccoon comes down, grabs the piece of metal, and as he comes to capture the raccoon, he ends up capturing him. Why and how? Because he used the, the raccoon's need to control things, to hold on to things against him. God says in the same way, the more we need to control people and control circumstances, it becomes the very thing that entraps us because we're not qualified for the job. This is why a belief in Christianity and the God who claims that he can control the world brings freedom to our life. Because instead of worrying about controlling circumstances, in moments of worry, I can say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to hand this situation over to you. I'm going to hand over my children to you. I'm going to hand over this job situation to you. I'm going to hand over my worries to someone qualified to handle the problems of the universe. Or when I have a tendency to overthink things, I have a tendency to say, God, I cannot possibly brainstorm every scenario what could happen here. And I am driving my brain crazy overthinking every scenario. I want to do the best I can, and I'm going to trust that you're working in the situation. Anxiety level goes down. Frustration levels go down. When you begin to find the freedom that says, I am not qualified to run the universe. It's very freeing, actually. I am not qualified. Because isn't that what worrying's doing? You're trying to run the universe by sort of worrying. In fact, there's a statistic that says that 70% of what you worry about will never happen. To which a worrier says, see, worrying works. No, no, that's not the application. That's not the application. The more you try and control and worry, the more you're damaging yourself instead of handing it over to God. In fact, I read a, uh, I saw an interview with uh, Clayton Kershaw, and he said that even as a pitcher, as a pitcher, that when he's trying to control where the where the ball goes on the mound, that if you overthink it, if you over control it, you actually lose control of the pitch. And notice how, as a pitcher and a person of faith, that actually trusting that there's something else bigger than his own control of a ball game allows him to throw and make the greatest pitches. Let's watch. I love this idea that his life felt very out of control, didn't know how he was going to make it, didn't know how he was going to 
pay for even college. And he decided to trust that maybe God was in control. And then he begins to have a heart for other people whose circumstances are out of control and saying, if God did this for me, maybe he should use the resources I have to do it for others. Our second character is controlled by fear. Mordecai's crazy fear. And again, think of Mordecai like Ferdinand or like Edmond from our story. He's the son of a clerk. He doesn't have any power. He's living in a kingdom that's otherwise incredibly powerful, and he's nothing but a pawn. And he would say, you know, the thing that controls my life isn't anger or pride or control. It's just fear. And he'd have good reason. Because if he told you his story, he would tell you that he was once living in his homeland. He got ripped from his homeland and carried away by the Babylonians. And then, just when he thought maybe there was finally some certainty in his life, the Persians came and conquered the Babylonians. He got carried away. So his whole life has been in transition. His whole life has been difficult, carried away and out of control. And if if, if Mordecai had a motto for his life, it would be this. If no one's in control of the universe in my life, and it doesn't look like anyone is, then my life's out of control. If there's no grand author, if there's no grand director, if there's nobody that I can trust with my life, I'm telling you, my life has just been one tragedy after another. And Esther would say the same thing. Because Esther would tell you that she lost her parents. Fear controls her life as well. Because now Mordecai has to raise Hadassah, that's her Hebrew name, which means hidden, And she's a cousin. And now, because she lost her mom and dad, she's saying, I don't think God's in control. And if he is, he can't be very loving. Because what kind of a loving God would take my mom and my dad? I'm just an orphan. And you could see how Mordecai and Esther could easily say, life's out of control. Nobody's really governing this place. Well, it's in that situation that the king having kicked his wife out for standing up against him, she's now gone. He decides to throw bachelor Persia. And they decide to invite all the women of the kingdom to come and basically spend a year being prepped in beauty treatments, being prepped in the ways of the king to see who will be the next queen. And this is so nerve-wracking for Mordecai that he is pacing back and forth every day at the city gate wondering what's happening. And for good reason. His cousin, his adopted daughter, has basically been pushed into a culture that is basically using her for her beauty, preparing her for her beauty, just to be used by the king for one night. You can see why they feel so fearful in this situation. Looking at their circumstances, you'd say, it doesn't seem like anyone's in control of this place. And here's where Mordecai will eventually be able to stand up and face his fear coming face to face with Haman. And here's the secret Esther will have and be able to risk her life to tell this new king that someone's trying to kill her and her family. They will begin to face their fear because they recognize there's another kind of king. See, in chapter 1 of Esther, the king has taken 180 days to parade his riches, to parade his power. 180 days to make sure everybody knew how important he was. 180 days to make sure everybody knew how rich he was. And now in chapter 2, we have another parade, parading the beauty of the women. I mean, can you imagine having to live in a culture that was all about parading your own wealth and power and beauty? <laughs> yes, we can. Things have not changed much, have they? And here is a book of the Bible that God's name is not even mentioned. And here's why. God is so secure in his strategy. God is so secure that he is 12 stages ahead, 12 steps ahead, 12 moves ahead. He doesn't have to parade his power. He doesn't have to parade his name. He doesn't have to parade his riches and glory. He's so secure he doesn't need to make a big deal about it. He can stay Hadassah, hidden Because he's going to use the king's anger. He's going to use Vashti's strong decision to put a new queen in place. And this is going to be a queen that's going to be needed many moves ahead. God quietly is working behind the scenes that the same Mordecai who stands up to Haman is the same Mordecai who just a few years earlier had discovered an assassination attempt on the king. 
And God is putting them in place so that when the time is needed, when Mordecai has to come face to face with Haman, who's trying to kill he and all his people, God will have already put a piece in play that he will need. And God is able to do all this quietly and strategically and without a grand parade because he's so secure that he's in control. And Esther and Mordecai will eventually discover that despite the circumstances in their life, despite the silence in their life, they can find great confidence in dealing with the crazy narcissists in their life by recognizing God is in control. I get to see people in our church do this all the time. Somebody tell me they got into a Bible study for the first time. They've been a worrier most of their life. 40 years of worrying, 50 years of worrying. And as they began to just be curious about just dabble with the idea that god was in control they would take their worries and just turn it toward god i want to hand this to you in prayer instead of being a worrier they became a prayer i talked to somebody this week that said i'm really struggling with revenge why because i'm fearful they're going to get away with it and i'm fearful that the story they're telling everybody everyone's going to buy it and it's not true I said, you know, that's really beyond your control. I can understand why you're frustrated. I can understand why you're angry. But that's really beyond what you can control, right? There's a great verse in the Bible that says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, speaking of Jesus, but instead Jesus entrusted himself to him who judges righteously. When you're in a situation that you're trying to judge others or keep them from being revenge or fearful to get away with it, I said, what you need is to trust somebody who is in control, somebody who can bring about ultimate justice, or you will wear yourself out. This person said, I'm going to memorize that verse. You brought this up to me before. I said, yeah, I memorized it years ago when I was struggling with the same thing. Our third emotion We find with Esther, Esther's crazy attraction. She finds control by being in control. And this gets really uh, interesting because it shows that she was taken and she was gathered. So almost like it was against her own will, she was taken into the king's court. And whether or not she's an actual victim of basically sex trafficking going on in the Persian Empire, or whether or not she's playing Persia Bachelor and decides, hey, if I'm going to play the game, I'm going to be good at it. And she's a player. She decides, hey, if the way for me to get out of my orphanage and not be so powerless is to seduce the king, I'm going to seduce him so well, I'm going to get treasures and and, and honors. And that's exactly what happens. It says the young woman pleased him and she obtained his favor. And she has his favor now. She wins her night with the king. And this shows again that one of the things besides regret and fear that can control our lives is sensuality. Sex is one of those things that's designed by God to to be a, a connecting, a passion, a joy, and a beauty in our relationships. But it becomes something that becomes addictive. It becomes destructive. It becomes tragic if it's used outside of its context. And here we have a whole culture that's basically taken women and turned them to nothing more than just a parade for the king. And into that, I think this the question we need to ask ourselves is whether or not we've rooted our identity in how we look. We've been, like the king, we've rooted our identity in our own sensuality or what we can medicate in our pain. I remember getting called to a friend's house several years ago, and he said, I really need help. Could you come to my house? I said, sure. I hadn't met him before. came to his house. He said, I just got found out all these pictures I have on, on the computer and it's of somebody and I just was in a lot of pain because of such going on in my life and I got into a little bit of addiction, a little bit of pornography and a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper to the point at which it just was totally out of control and we prayed together. So let me help. He says, what happened was I went from this being a thing that I enjoyed with my wife to a thing I used to medicate pain to the thing that I used to give me meaning and purpose and the problem was, he said, Whatever I did, it wasn't enough the next time. It was like I needed a deeper and deeper hit, a kinkier and kinkier. It just could never fully satisfy. And that's why sex is such a bad God. It's a great connector, but it's a really bad God for your life. Ernest Beckert, in her book, The Denial of Death, says this, We look to sex and romance to give us the transcendence and sense of meaning we used to get from faith in God which many might think her commentary is outdated, 
Well, you know, as you really say, Chad, we don't try and get transcendence from sexuality. We just sort of, you know, have a hookup culture and it's just casual. It's just biological. But in her book, Unhooked, the research they did showed the hookups left most young women unsatisfied, though they're unwilling to admit this to their peers. That was God designed sexuality not to be something that would be our ultimate identity. If you pull it too high, it destroys you. But if you set it too low and too casual, it doesn't work. What's happening here with Esther is that Esther, we see the power of sexuality. Look how C.S. Lewis said it in the 1940s. He said, you know, you can get a large audience together for a striptease act. That is to watch a girl in dress on the stage. Now, suppose you came to a country where you could fill a theater by simply bringing a covered plate on the stage and slowly lifting the cover so everyone could see just before the lights went out that it contained a mutton chop or a bit of bacon. Would you not think that in that country something had gone seriously wrong with the appetite for food? And here's the thing. Whether we're being controlled by fear or regret or our own sensuality, God is saying you need to discover who's really in control to help you get free from this, to help you find deeper meaning and purpose in your life, to help put the things in your life that are good back together again. Which brings us to our fourth character, and that's Haman. Haman, again, is our Ferdinand character. I love that line in the movie where he said, Why are you doing this? It's complicated. Why, why, why? Because you're the son of a clerk and I'm not supposed to want to be like you. Here's a man who has riches, power, name recognition. He's a duke. And yet he recognizes that this other character has something secure, a love, a meaning, and a contentment that he really wants. That all the things he rooted his identity in, all the things he built his life upon, didn't fully and finally satisfy. That is exactly what Haman is like. Haman's motto could be this, I lose control when others don't know I'm in control. See, Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him. Then the king's servant said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? They told Haman, he's not bowing down to you. Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, he was filled with wrath. And that's why I say his motto would be, I lose control when others don't know I'm in control. To which I would say to you, if you have to tell people you're in control, you're not in control. You have to tell people you're in charge, you're not really in charge. And anger has begun to become obsessive in his life. And here's why. If you have uncontrolled anger, it's always a sign of insecurity in your life. Now, not healthy anger. There's things to be angry about. Even God's anger, it's always proportional. It's always appropriate. God is never out of control in his anger. We get out of control in our anger because in our anger, we put our identity in something insecure, and then we're mad that it's insecure. People better recognize how important I am. People aren't recognizing how important I am. Therefore, I'm angry and going to tell them they better recognize how important I am. And this is why it's so insecure. Because you're putting your identity in how other people respond. Always insecure. You're putting your identity in how circumstances respond. Always insecure. And so you lose control when people don't recognize that you're in control. And that's why it's so insecure. You see, we all like to be recognized. But as a Christian, when you recognize that you're not defined by being recognized, you can be disappointed if people don't recognize you, but you're not filled with uncontrollable wrath. You can be in a conversation and you think you're right. In fact, you might even be right, but you don't need to be right to be somebody. And so instead of being out of control, angry at your spouse or your partner or your friend or your, your, your buddy, You can still have a very healthy debate with anger, but it's not uncontrollable anger because we're just talking about an issue, not talking about who we are. The minute you put your identity in being recognized, in having respect, in being right, it brings all kinds of insecure emotions into the situation. So much so that you can be the right-hand man of the king of Persia with all the accolades and all the power of being right-hand to the king of the world, and yet despite all that elevation, all that power, all that recognition, your whole life can fall apart when a little bitty pawn doesn't recognize you and bow down to you. 
Why do the little things make such a big deal to us except that we've built our identity on something insecure, which is why it's driving us crazy? And that's why if anger is spewing out of you in a way that is incredibly unhealthy or out of control, it might be time to ask yourself, have I built my identity on something insecure? Do you see a lot of fear in your life? You might have built your identity on something insecure. A lot of regret in your life? A lot of addictive behaviors in your life relate to sensuality or, in this case, a lot of anger in your life. And here's where I think the Bible gets real practical for us. How do we deal with our own craziness? Because we all do this at times. How do we deal with other people who are building their life on craziness and are trying to pull us into it? I'll give you three principles that have been helpful for me in a couple books if you want to dig deeper into this. Because all of us are going to, like Vashti, at some point come face to face with a king who asks us to do something that's against our conscience. We're all going to at some point come face to face with a narcissist who's going to demand things from us that are not appropriate and it's really about feeding their own ego or feeding their own fears. That's what's driving the situation. So how do we deal with the crazies in our life? Three things. Number one, we need to recognize (coughs) this principle that demanding control leads to losing control until you really discover who's in control. When you discover God's really in control of the universe and really the defining marker of your life, it brings so much security to insecure situations. Number one, you can recognize that difficult people are actually insecure people. Now, it doesn't, the king of Persia doesn't seem very insecure. Haman wouldn't seem very insecure. He's right hand to the king with all the riches and power. But what we discover in the story is these seemingly powerful people are incredibly insecure. Why? Because one little man just saying, hey, I'm Jewish. I respect you. I respect the kingdom. I just don't bow down to anyone but my God. Just that little conversation. And all of a sudden, the whole kingdom is unstable. One woman says she won't dance with her crown before the king, and the king has to quickly gather all his nobles together and pass a law that women nowhere in the Persian kingdom can speak to their husbands that way. The Bible reveals here that there's a lot of insecurity amongst these difficult people, and that helps because when you come to a situation when you're dealing with somebody who's difficult, you feel the fear and the pressure and the anxiety, and it feels like they're in control of all the situation. But what Vashti found, what Mordecai finds, and what Esther will discover is that when you realize that God's in control, that he's going to maneuver the circumstances in your life to a greater good, you can take a stand. Because you recognize you're not dealing with secure people who are making secure decisions. You're dealing with insecure people. In fact, I love the book's boundaries. If you've never read the boundaries books, they're very helpful in being able to be respectful but also set healthy boundaries. I remember uh, Townsend, one of the guys who wrote the book, he one day uh, (coughs) was at a conference and a man came up to him and said, hey, can I tell you, thank you so much for reading that Boundaries book. It's changed my life. He changed your life? It changed my life. Wow. Well, what was your favorite chapter? Well, I didn't read it. He didn't read it. Because my wife read it. (laughs) Well, five years ago she read it. But you know what I realized? I realized I I was a really crummy communicator, and I had some really bad habits. But through the Boundaries book, she was able to communicate in a way that was respectful to me and appreciative to me and honorable to me, but also call me on some of those bad behaviors. And I am a better man because of it. And we have such a closer relationship than we ever had. doesn't mean I always enjoyed all the steps of it, but I realized I had built my life on a lot of insecure things, and I was dragging her into that. Now, King Xerxes is not saying that about Vashti. And Haman is not saying that about Mordecai. What I'm telling you is when you build your identity on knowing God is in control, you can actually love people, genuinely love difficult people, and set boundaries in place that don't allow their fears and anxieties and controlling tendencies to control your life. Which brings us to our second point and two more books I recommend. Remember that we're all controlled by something. Remember Kierkegaard said, you're either building your identity on God or on something else. And self-pride, the belief that you can control your own destiny, is the biggest problem in the human heart. We're all controlled by something, but it doesn't need to be the difficult people in your life. 
Two books that are very helpful on dealing with difficult people and putting boundaries in place. Crucial Conversations. Great Conversation, a business book, discusses the importance of being able to have truthful conversations about disagreements. What they found in the research was the distance between the time you identify a problem and the time that you talk about the problem is a measurement of the trust in your relationship. And the best business partnerships, the best colleagues in business, the best marriages, the best family relationships are those who have enough trust. They know how to have crucial conversations that you can, when something's going wrong, speak up and talk about that in a very healthy way. And it really gives you some real practical ways to have those conversations and why it's important. The other one is Necessary Endings, a book I've read three or four times. Because there are certain negative patterns, certain destructive patterns that people in your life are pulling you into that need to come to an ending. And we need to learn how to give wisdom to people who are wise. We need to learn how to deal with fools in our life with boundaries and consequences. And then there's evil people in your life who are out to kill you. And when that happens, you need guns and lawyers <laughs> to protect yourself. It's a very practical application of knowing who you're dealing with. Are you dealing with the wise, the fool, or the evil? And what are different strategies to use for those three different groups? The third principle I think it's important in dealing with the craziness in yourself and others is to remember to use wisdom and boundaries when you're dealing with difficult people. Here's what, again, is amazing about Esther. Esther will eventually, as the queen, have to go before a king who says, you can't even come into my presence without being called or you'll be killed. And she will courageously believe that God is working, courageously believe that God's put her in a position to have this conversation. At great risk to her life, she goes to speak to the king of the universe at the time. And when you watch how she speaks, it is with such wisdom and is with, she, she sets a boundary. I don't want to be killed. But the way she goes about it is so strategic. Her word choice is so honorable to a man who speaks the words of honor and respect. If I have found favor in your eyes, and if it pleases the king, I'd like to bring this to your attention. She strategically picks a meal to do it. The timing wasn't quite right in the first day, so she waits for another day. And then she words this conversation as if she knows her husband is all about the bottom line. It's very clever how she words it. She says, you know what, if, me and my, if my people and I were only to be sold as male and female slaves, I wouldn't have brought this to your attention. It wouldn't be important enough for you. Though it would have come at great cost to you. <laughs> so she's a salesman. She's selling, you know what? What's happening around here is going to cost you a lot of money. Who, who, who would dare to come against my wife? And then she turns and points the finger at Haman and says, The enemy and adversary is this evil and wicked Haman, for he has targeted to kill me and my people. And what I love about Esther's conversation and her strategy is she is so wise. Her life is at risk no matter what. These are high-stake conversations. But she is able to communicate in the midst of a difficult situation where thousands of people's lives are at stake with this principle, wisdom and boundaries. It's another book that uh, I'd recommend from 1995 called Don't Let the Jerks Get the Best of You. So it's a great book on how do we deal with the difficult people in our life. Here's my hope. My hope is that in a world where either people are truth tellers who just there's carnage everywhere from just telling the truth, and you're like, oh, that hurts. And people who are so addicted to other people's approval they can't ever say the truth. What the Bible offers you is the unique balance of being a person of grace and truth. Healthy boundaries for conversations, but communicate in a very healthy way. You can say it in a very healthy way, but you don't not say the last 10% of truth. And the way we do that is by rooting our identity, not in people's approval, not in outcomes, not in our fears, not in our anxieties, but in the truth that God is in control and he's working in and through the situations in my life. What if you could trust the author of your favorite movie? What if you could trust the author of your favorite book to be writing a crescendo ending to your life? Wouldn't it change your worries? And wouldn't it change your anxieties as you're going through those chapters of your life? I'm going to give you a chance to do that this week. As you dig into the book that we gave you, uh, if you haven't got one, you can get one on the way out. It's going to dig deeper and deeper into this idea of how do we deal with the craziness in ourselves, in our world, in our life. Let's pray together. Father, we just ask that you would teach us 
how we can be a little less crazy. Teach us how we can deal with the craziness of the people around us. And God, help us to acknowledge that many of us have lost control in different areas of our life simply because we demanded control. God, show us that by trusting in your coincidences, we can actually find more freedom in our own lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us today. Like I said, if you don't have one of those uh, booklets, you can grab one of those on the way out. If you came prepared to give, you can do that as well. Thanks for being here. We'll see you all next week.